see you. Michael White serve as the, uh, the lead pastor here at Freedom. I do uh, most of the preaching and teaching, uh, but not all of it. Uh, thrilled that you would be here today. Uh, we try to say it uh, all the time, but uh, this is a safe place for you, no matter uh, kind of where, you at, where you're at in uh, relation to God. Uh, whether you're a Christian looking for a church home or maybe an unbeliever or a skeptic, uh, just sort of exploring, just want to put you at ease. Uh, we are glad that you're here. I want you to stay and uh, hang with us uh, even. We're in the a book of uh, 1 Peter, uh, going through a, a series uh, entitled uh, The Pilgrim's Path. And sort of the book of 1 Peter and uh, even the, the focus, therefore, of this sermon series is how we are foreigners as Christians. We are living in an alien land, in a, in a place that... This, uh, that the world is not our home. And this, this past week was another reminder of that, at least uh, for me. Late Wednesday night, uh, the news broke. Uh, probably you saw it if you, you know, don't live in a cave and don't watch any news at all, which honestly these days is not a bad path. <laughs> I mean, just got to be honest with you. Um, but uh, Hugh Hefner, uh, who was the founder of uh, Playboy uh, magazine, had died. And instantly... Tributes uh, began to uh, pour in. Hefner's uh, son, and I guess the heir to the uh, empire, such as it is, um, held, his, held his dad as a, as a media and cultural pioneer. Gene Simmons, who is the uh, uh, lead singer of, uh, of a Kiss, if you didn't know. Um, he, he, he called Hefner a, a great man, an entrepreneur, and an innovator. Larry King, some of you remember him from uh, back in the day, talk show on, uh, on CNN, Larry King Live. Uh, Larry King uh, said he is a giant in publishing, journalism, free speech, and civil rights. And I guess those things are true in a, in a sense, right? Hugh Hefner, Playboy, was instrumental in shifting our culture. I don't think that can be denied. His, his one insight was that sex sells. Sex would sell, at least in that time when he was pitching it. He went to a group of prospective investors when he was beginning to, and there at the beginning, before the magazine was launched. Um, and he, um, in a letter that he wrote to him, he said, sex is surefire. In other words, sex, it, it's going to sell. It, it, it can't not work. And he was right. He was right. The other necessary shift that had to come about was that the, the pornography, that uh, sexuality had to come from or go from the ghetto and then be brought into the living room. And so to do that, which I think it's, there's no question that he accomplished that, and we can see kind of just even the standards of television and the things that, that come on, you know, at 8 and 9 o'clock in our homes. Um, the, the way he, he did that was he fabricated an alluring image, a, a sophisticated, a cultured, successful man. At least that was what he was trying to present, who then, of course, that kind of man, right, would be surrounded by all sorts of young, uh, beautiful, sort of equal women that he could kind of choose from. The ideal man, as was presented by Hafner and by the magazine, um, was uh, promiscuous and completely uncommitted. The ideal woman offered herself freely and, of course, should be thin. She should be basically infertile, right? Always available, therefore childless. So I think it's undeniable that these things have shaped our culture, that these, this magazine and other streams of influence that it brought about uh, fueled the sexual revolution that has swept through our country beginning in the 1960s until now. And so there's no denying that he, he has had a large influence over our society. But for, for those of us men, for those of us men here who have been uh, wrecked by his vision of masculinity, such as it was, who have been ensnared by the trap that he set, for those of us men, and let's just be honest, it's, I have to say it's probably virtually all of us, virtually every person in this room, every man, has been affected by this. We have had our, our minds permanently warped by the, the vision of what he has done. And so for those of us men that have been affected by, twisted by the things that he published 
uh, he's not a great man. And I'm not, I'm not trying to blame him. Obviously, the sin is in our own hearts, right? So, so, don't, so don't misunderstand. Um, the sin is in our own hearts. That was just the opportunity that was created. But we would not look at him and, and say he's a, he's a great man. For, for women, because ladies, you're in this too, right? For the women who have been, on the one hand, it's such a, a strange juxtaposition, right? On the one hand, our culture is saying, hey, you're free, you know, women's lib, you're, you're, you're liberated to do whatever you want to. You're equals alongside of men. But then, on the other hand, at the same time, almost both sides of our mouth, this magazine and other things are objectifying you ladies, Right? You're told that you have value actually only to the extent that you meet Playboy's standard of beauty. And so for you also, Hefner is not a great man. This world is not our home. As these news reports and as these, the, the praise uh, just sort of uh, poured in, I just thought, what, where, where are we? What world are we living in that this, the, that a man who, who propounded the things that he did, it created the revolution in, in a sense that he did, that he would receive this kind of phrase. Like all of us though, Hefner has a backstory. I didn't realize it till just because I'm curious and kind of following it up as the news is, is breaking. He has a backstory. He has a family. So biographers say that he was, um, and this is a direct quote from a biographer, that he was an emotionally needy byproduct of, of grace, his mother, who was a devout uh, Methodist who never hugged him. His mother wanted him to be a missionary. And let's be honest, he, he did become a missionary in a sense, a missionary with a very different gospel, uh, but he became a missionary for what he believed. He describes himself in his own words a, as a very idealistic, very romantic kid in a very typically uh, Midwestern Methodist um, repressed home. He says, there was no show of affection of any kind. I escaped to dreams and fantasies produced by and large by the music in the movies of the 1930s. One writer notes, and this is I think significant, instructive for us, parents, grandparents, like every person um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the quote or the, the thing that was so noteworthy was uh, that there was no mention anywhere of Hebner's father, ever. His mom was Grace, and we don't know anything about his dad at all. And so, what is driving Hefner? Well, like every person who has ever lived, we are wired up to desire love, to long for love. And the fruit of that pursuit is, is evident in his life and the way he lived his life and the way he pursued it. Just use that as an example, not to slam him, not, not to slam him, not to speak ill of the dead. Um, we should pray for him, right? We should pray for those who have been ensnared by him and sort of what he created. Um, but but a, it was just such a tangible example of the reality that this world is not our home. We are pilgrims walking through a world. We do not share the cultural values that are around us. And yet, even as every person cares about love and longing, even that's what Hefner was driven by, true Christianity is about love and longing. It is. It's about love and longing. Oh, though, as you might guess, they're different objects of love and longing, not the same thing that... Hugh Hefner would have taught. And so if you open your copy of God's Word, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, what we're going to see is Peter uh, talking to these early Christians who are also finding themselves out of step with the culture around them. Suddenly, the people that have grown up in the culture, they have come to believe in Christ, the Messiah. They have been born again by God's Spirit. Holy Spirit is sanctifying them. He is pressing out evil, convicting sin. They're being transformed. And as that is happening, they look around and they don't belong in the culture that they are in either. People in the culture are talking and saying, well, y'all are, are such prudes. 
y'all are, y'all are weird. Why do, you, why do you care about holiness? And as Christians who've been born again by the gospel, we must give ourselves to a particular love and uh, to a, a particular longing. And so that's the, that's the message today. If you're taking notes, the, the title is Love and Longing. Uh, and then the, the main idea is there on the screen uh, for you. True Christians. What I mean when I say true is authentic Christians, real believers, people who have genuinely been born again. True Christians are known by their love and their longing. So first uh, Peter uh, chapter 1, we'll go into uh, chapter 2 through verse uh, 3 today. So 1 Peter uh, 1, uh, 22. Uh, by the way, that page number there, if you want to pick up a Bible, if you don't have one, uh, should be in the seat underneath you or in front of you. Uh, turn to page 588 and you'll find 1 Peter uh, 1. So here now, this is God's word. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass. All its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, so Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we rejoice in the goodness of of you, of your provision, or more satisfying, more delightful, more joy-giving than anything our minds can fathom. And so would you teach us, Lord, would you teach us by your word this morning and by your Holy Spirit? Lord, help us to have right loves, help us to have right longing that we would indeed be your children who have been purchased by the blood of your Son. Give grace this morning, we pray, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So just diving right in, true true Christians are are known uh, by loving one another deeply. True Christians love one another deeply. That is the love that we are motivated by. That is the love that we are driven by. We see that just in these first uh, few uh, verses. So Peter, if again, to just go back, if you've not been with us, uh, easy to just, when you preach, kind of chapter by chapter, verse by verse like we do, you can just go back up and read the previous section uh, if you miss a week and kind of know uh, where we're at. But Peter has been unpacking the nuts and bolts of the Christian life. Last week, uh, we looked at verses 13 to 21, and, and we just saw that he is urging, he was urging those Christians uh, living in what would mo- be modern day uh, Turkey. Um, he is urging them to, uh, to set their hope completely on the grace of God. That's the gospel, so the gospel that saved them. He said, set your hope completely on that and nothing else. Uh, Strive for holiness. That's where he's been at. And this week he comes to uh, our love and our longings. And here, just in this first uh, section, it's, it's very clear that he is urging us to love each other. He's speaking to to Christians who would be gathered in a church. This isn't some sort of generic love to be had outside the boundaries of the local church, although certainly we are to love um, all people. But he's talking specifically about the love that should be manifest in the congregation, in the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ. And so he says, having, verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now notice over and over again as he does, the the starting point is again the gospel and it's it, and it's fruit. So the gospel, the belief that God has has saved us, that God has changed us, that the Spirit is transforming us, and so that should lead to certain fruit in our lives. What was happened, he says, is that we were formerly dirty, we were formerly sin-stained, and now we have been purified. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. 
And so Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says that though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And so we were formerly, if you were in Christ now, you were formerly filthy, dirty. Your soul was unclean. But now by the gospel, you are clean, you are white, you have been washed as white as snow. So we can't overstate the, the transformation that is happening in our lives when we turn from faith, uh, turn by faith from sin into Christ. There's a radical transformation that's taking place in our lives, and our lives ought to look like that, such that our old lives are unrecognizable. I know this is like super old movie, but I, for some reason I, I went here. Robin Williams in uh, the movie Mrs. Doubtfire. Y'all remember that? I mean, in a long time, right? But he would like do the, the old lady look and it's like, who is this guy, right? That, that's the kind of unrecognizableness of our old selves. Because we have been obedient to the truth. What is the truth? Well, this is the truth of the gospel. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have come and we have committed ourselves to follow him, been, been obedient to his call to repent and believe. And so we've been obedient to the gospel. As a result, then our souls are now purified. We are clean. And it's, it's, significant, it's significant that the, the word purified uh, in the Greek, in the original language, is in the perfect tense. I don't always kind of call attention to these things, but when it's important, it, it's worth noting. So the perfect tense what that, what that signifies is that it's a, it's a one-time event that happened. Um, so we were purified when we came to faith in Jesus Christ, whenever that was in your life. And then that, that event has ongoing ramifications for our lives. It's a one-time event that, that has ongoing influence and ongoing impact in our lives. That's what the perfect tense means. And so having purified your souls, that happened, and our souls should continue being purified. We continue to grow into the thing that has, has changed us and transformed us. And so following Jesus isn't some sort of um, kind of intellectual decision that we make, and then we just set it on the shelf. Following Jesus is not some sort of uh, kind of like cost-benefit analysis where it's like, hmm, you know, better safe than sorry, hell, if it even exists, you know, it's a long time, and so just to kind of hedge my bets, I'm going to believe in Jesus and I'm going to do this thing, you know, better safe than sorry, right? That's, that's, not, that's not what biblical Christianity is. It is belief that leads to action, it's belief that leads to transformed lives. And so we have been made holy. Our souls have been purified. And so that means that then we should then strive to live holy. Try to grow into what we have been made. This is the essence of Christianity. There will be setbacks. There'll be sin struggles was talking uh, to a, a sister on my way to get some water. And she said, are you behaving yourself? Are you doing all right? I was like, uh, that's why we're in a family, right? Like we help each other grow. We push each other to godliness. So there will be struggles. We expect that. But we grow together in holiness. That's, that's what it means to be a believer of Jesus Christ. And then one of the main applications of this, the fact that we have been purified, the fact that we have been cleansed from our sins, is that as we come together, look at it, it's for a sincere brotherly love. Do you see that there in verse 22? That's the purpose of this. We're being purified by, from our sin, brought into a place where there should be sincere brotherly love, that we would love each other earnestly, uh, from the heart, from a pure heart. So what is it that Jesus says? I mean, Peter, right? He was a disciple. He walked with Jesus. He's not unpacking some kind of radically new concept. He's just teaching what Jesus taught. Jesus says in John 13, he says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. Peter says, love one another earnestly. There should be sincere brotherly love here. And so let's just kind of unpack, like Peter's unpacking that. Let's walk with him through that. First he says, it should be sincere. 
Or another way to translate that, and certainly we could go down to 2 1, that there should be no hypocrisy. There should be no hypocrisy in our love for each other. It should be real, it should be true, genuine, it's sincere. And honestly, I mean, this is, I think I've said this before, maybe just private conversation. Like, this is a challenge for us as Southerners. This kind of cuts against our, our cultural vibe because what, what do Southerners do? Oh, yeah, I'm great. You know, we do the, we do the smile thing. Yeah, I'm, everything's fine. I'm good. How are you? You know, and we, we put on the, the happy, smiley stuff. It's, it's real popular nowadays, right, to hate on fake news, isn't it, right? But, but we are all about some fake love. We are all about that. Oh, man, I will fake with you all day long, so you think I'm fine. I'm not letting you in. I'm keeping you at, you know, kind of stiff arm all the way around, right? I'm not letting you into my life, and I'm going to pretend like I'm good. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to put on this nice smiley face that pretends to love you, but can be hypocritical, right? What that means, hypocritical, is when you, you know, present one way and then you act another. And so we walk away and we mutter something other under our breath. Or we are thinking things about that person, slandering them in our minds, even while we're shaking our hand, you know, doing the, doing the thing, right? Bless their hearts, right? That, that, kind, of, that kind of thing, and so surely, church, and I don't know in what ways, surely even this morning, if you rolled in here at, at 10.15 or, or 10.20, if you're here earlier for Sunday school or a D group, however long you've been here, probably there's already been hypocritical love. I don't know what it is. It's not my job to do that. The Holy Spirit, even right now, I would pray, would put his finger on your heart to expose the way you and your own personality, the own, way, own life, you love your brothers and sisters hypocritically. Second, it's not just this uh, sincere, unhypocritical brotherly love. It's supposed to be earnest. Love one another earnestly from the heart, verse 22 says. That word earnest, I don't know if you use the word earnest uh, very much. I, I don't happen to do that. But it's probably in Greek better translated constant or fervent or, or deep. Kind of in that constellation of, uh, of concepts. The, the, the idea is that there's this intensity or depth to our love for one another. And so what this means is that there, we love one another not just when we feel like it. It's a, it's a deep love that even goes beyond, you know, I'm, I'm feeling it today. It's an enduring, patient sort of love. It becomes part of the, the fabric of our lives. And so we love our, our faith family from the heart. We, we value being around one another. We rejoice with those who are rejoicing. We weep with those who weep. Life is all about high highs and low lows. And every week, again, in, as we gather in a room this size with a, a, this number of people, trust me, because I know more than, than most, I, I know some of the situations that are out here, right? There, there's, there's grief and heartache and disappointment on the one hand and joy and excitement and can't wait, you know, for something, the next thing or whatever that's happening on the other hand. And so just know that that's, that's what it is. And, and God does that. God puts us into this family so that, that we can experience all of that together. The highs being an encouragement to the lows. The, the, the lows keeping the highs from being um, sort of prideful and, and boastful. So we come together as this, as this mix of emotions and feelings uh, to be God's family. Now, when I, when I say that this is a faith family, and when I exhort you to be a part of this faith family, I know that for some of you, there's like a mental objection that gets raised. And the objection is something like, Man, I, I've already got a family. You know, I don't, I don't, need, I don't need another family. I'm good. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want these people up in my mess. I don't want to be up in their mess, maybe, right? And so you're thinking, I'm good. I'm good on the family thing, right? And, and I'm not at all telling you to diss your biological family, all right? Because my biological family, I've got a sister-in-law and a mother-in-law that are here. 
I think they're in the nursery, so technically I could say what I want to uh, about them or about our family, but I'm not. Um, but I, I'm not telling you to dish your natural family. That's, that's not at all what it is. But, but you do realize, you, you do realize, don't you, that there will not be a white family reunion, or that's my last name, uh, is White. Um, you know, whatever your name is, just with racial stuff, I had to, you, you got to be careful, I'm, I'm telling you. I was talking to another guy with the same last name about this. It's really hard to joke with your last name. Um, but whatever your last name is, I mean, uh, Peeler, Hawkins, Knipe, you know, whatever, it's just uh, Bowen, I see, like, it, there, there's not going to be that family reunion on the other side when you gather with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, you, I'm not saying you're not going to see loved ones and that they won't know you. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But that's not what it's going to be about. Like, we're not going to have our own, like, picnic shelters, like, where we're all kind of divided, you know. And, and there will be a meal, and it will be a glorious feast. There will be a marriage supper of the Lamb, and it will be wonderful. But, but your grandma's potato salad is not going to be there, all right? The Lord himself will make a rich feast of rich food and of wine, full age. This is Isaiah 25, the vision. And we will eat and we will drink with who? The family of God. We, we sing that song here. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will uh, weep no more. We will eat and weep no more. That's the heavenly banquet. That's the family reunion that that song and the scriptures hold out for us so again i'm not i'm not dogging natural biological families at all okay that's not what i'm doing but i am asking are you making investments in the family with which you will gather around the throne of god forever do you know these people do you love these people because he has given you brothers and sisters and spiritual dads, and spiritual mothers, and spiritual grandparents, and cousins, and nieces, and nephews right here. Friends, just to put in a plug for D groups, it's such a glorious thing when D groups gather, and our little girl who's three years old I mean, is, is literally waiting at the front door, waiting, ready to invite people into our home. And it's because you're, you're her family. She, she loves the people of God. So I just want to exhort you, if you're not investing in this community you, you, you one you're missing out two you're you're being unbiblical uh, so that's the you know maybe a more important thing but but you are missing um what it is you cannot love people you don't talk to you can't love people who you don't spend time with you can't love people who you don't know and so don't don't neglect don't neglect this body this is the way the church grows if we look at Ephesians 4, it grows up by earnest love. It says, speaking the truth in love to one another, Paul says, we are to grow up in every way into him, into, into him who is the head, into Christ, who from the whole body is, is joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. And when each part is working properly, all the parts of the body, that kind of metaphor for the church as a body of Christ, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in, what's the last word? It's on the screen. Love. Love. Love for one another. Pure, sincere, earnest, constant, devoted. That's how this body grows. That's how the kingdom of God advances, that we love each other. And so let me just pause for a second too and, and speak to, to any unbelievers that might be here. Again, you're welcome uh, or you're a skeptic, you're a seeker. Let me just on behalf of God's church for whatever it counts, because um, I don't speak for, for every pastor or every church uh, by any means, but let me apologize because I think the church has been a really poor witness of this to, to the culture, to the community. Churches are known, and, and freedom uh, has a little bit of this history. I mean, it's, 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 it, there's a lot of pain and, and brokenness, and also joy and freedom in the launch of even this church. But, but let me just apologize. The church has not done a great job loving each other. The church has been, a, I was talking to, a, to another brother about a, a local church. Um, we, could, we could drive to it in four or five minutes probably. And 
that church, he told me, has, you know, since he was a kid, which he's, you know, mid-50s maybe, has been known as a church that likes to fight and likes to have bruising business meetings and likes to, yeah, hate on each other. And that's the church's reputation. And so just if you're an unbeliever, you're, you've looked at the church and, and, and you're, 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 the fact that you're here this morning means something, um, but, but I'm, I'm sorry that, that the church has that reputation. We at Freedom Church want to be different. We want to follow the scriptures. We want to love each other. The reality is we're sinful people. We have sinful pastors, even elders who are leading, right? Well, I'm not perfect, right? I'm striving towards godliness. Our elder team is striving towards godliness, but, but we get things wrong too. And so I, I, I'm sorry that the church has been a poor witness, a poor example of this. It's not what our Lord calls us to when we want to do um, better. So for what that's worth, I want to give that uh, to you. Back in, back in the text, why is it that we must have this love for each other? Look at verse 23. Since, he says, your translation might say because or having been born again. But there's a causal connection here. Having been born again, because you have been born again, this is why we must have this sincere, earnest love for each other. And how is it that we have been born again? Well, we've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Peter seems to like that word perishable. We, we'll, we'll run into it again as we go forward through the book. Uh, we, we see it, that the, the inheritance that we have in, in uh, verse 4 is imperishable. Um, we were ransomed, not with perishable things, but by the precious blood of Christ there in verse 18. And he says, look, we have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. So here's the reality again. Earthly families love earthly families. Praise God for earthly families. But earthly families will pass away. Gold, silver, all these things will pass away. But we have new life through a living and abiding word of God. And that word we, we see at the end of the verse is the gospel, or at the end of verse 25. This word is the good news that was preached to us. It abides. It is eternal. The gospel is. It brings about a resurrected life. So it will not fade or end. It is eternal. And this is so different than anything else, isn't it? There's nothing that lasts. There's nothing that lasts but the word of God and the gospel that has saved us. It's so helpful. Such an encouragement as we look around and we see man, this world is not our home. What in the world is going on, right? I mean, the NFL protests and I mean, just everything that's going on in our culture, just the, the, the racial uh, tension, all of these things. And so in the midst of all of that frustration and angst, what do we come to? We come to something that is imperishable. Verse 24, all flesh is like grass, all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. We can sink our teeth here. We can rest here. We can lay down on the couch and prop up our feet and know that the word of God is forever, imperishable, unfading, undefiled. It will be the word of God, inerrant infallible forever so all flesh by contrast is fleeting and temporary it greens up it looks nice for a while right sure it does right does it flower and bloom sure things look great for a season did Hugh Hefner's empire look nice and shiny with a mansion and wealth and lifestyle and women and sexual pleasure well, surely we must say, yes, it has. Yes, it did. But the grass withers, the flower falls off. Money rots and goes away. It gets lost. Even the Playboy Mansion is in, uh, is in tatters because they have not kept it up. And so it would be so foolish to stake our life on these things that are so temporary, that are so fleeting. Yes, the wicked prosper for a season. Yes, sin is pleasurable for a season, the scripture says, but ultimately it will not satisfy. Why? Because the Lord has set eternity in your heart, the scripture says. He has created you for himself, so you will not be satisfied with mere earthly attractions. The word of the Lord, the gospel remains forever. It reigns forever. 
And so what is the, the implication of that? Again, we've been born again by this imperishable gospel. Well, ignore the chapter to, uh, division. Those things aren't original. Right? So Peter didn't put a period and a number two or anything like that. Uh, look there at verse one. Just runs all together in his argument. In light of everything that he has said, he then says, he comes to this, he says, so or therefore put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander again he's he's talking about love we've been born again by this imperishable seed this internal family has has uh has we've been brought into and so therefore as we have relationships with one another this is the way we must conduct ourselves put away malice Malice is, is ill will, it's, it's thoughts, um, just evil thoughts uh, towards uh, people, a desire to see them harmed. And so my guess is probably nobody is, has had that in some sort of, um, at least I hope not, if, if you have, we have law enforcement officials here who'd love to talk to you afterwards. But um, like, like the way this manifests itself is not just like, I want to kill this person, but it's, it's wishing bad upon them, wishing ill upon them. And that's closely linked to envy, which, again, is one of the things that we must put away. You know, and so maybe, maybe there's some people here, you're just tired of another person seeming to get all the breaks in life. You wish things would just quit working out for them. It's like, why is their life so perfect and mine is over here in the dumpster, you know, that's on fire, right? Like, why is that happening for me? And they're doing this. They just got this promotion. They just had this new baby. They're getting all this attention. They just got this recognition over here. They have a stable marriage. It looks good. They've got a single life. They can do whatever they want to. Maybe there's jealousy there. They have financial ease. They have good looks. They're gifted in these ways. They have this influence in the city or in the county. They're healthy and you're not. All those things can be envy. In envy that then sort of leads to malice and ill will towards a brother or a sister. And let me just say, some of you, I mean, many of you are on social media. And social media, like anything else, can be used for good or can be used for, for bad, right? And, and your social media habit, your Facebook scrolling, your Instagram looking and liking, that, that can pour gas on the, the initial flame of envy and malice. Because you begin seeing everybody's curated visions of their life. Which nobody's life is like it actually is on Facebook, right? And Instagram, you know that, right? Everybody's putting forward, it's a little bit hypocritical, right? We're putting forward the best moments. Nobody, you know, says, man, me and my wife just had a massive fight. We're trying to figure out if we're going to make it or not. You know, nobody does that, right? It's like, oh, we're going on this lovely date, and this is wonderful, and the kids are behaving. That's, we, we, we're not real with each other, right? And so that leads, that fuels the fire of envy. We must put away malice. We must put away envy. We must put away deceit. We must put away deceit. And that's a part of deceit, right? Is living hypocritically. Deceit can be straight up lying, but it can also be more sophisticated than that. We shade the truth, don't we? We mislead by only telling half-truths. We tell the best things about ourselves. We misrepresent things so that we appear to be the hero, that we look good, that other people look bad. That's deceit. That's straight up wrong. And, and this destroys love. All these things destroy love because we're not being real with each other. Love only flourishes in the truth. And so if we're constantly deceiving one another, that our marriage is fine, that our parenting is, is good, that our job is secure, whatever, we're walking with God and things are great. If we're deceiving people in that, what we will be is a community of fakers and phonies. It's not what God is calling us to be. We, we say, you heard it at the top of the sermon, I said this is a safe place, right? But if, if we're just going to hide and be fake with each other, it doesn't matter if it's a safe place or not. It doesn't matter if it's a place where you can be real with your hurts and your hang-ups and come in here no matter how you look or how you feel. So we must put away deceit and hypocrisy that is like it. And we must put away, talked about hypocrisy, we must put away slander, which slander is just slamming one another with our speech. There should be no place for that in the house of God. You can slander, and by house of God, I mean not a building, right? But in God's people, right? Among God's church. So you can slander somebody with lies 
Or, here's, here's more often the way it happens, at least for me, so just going to tell on myself. I'm going to tell the truth about somebody, or at least the truth as I see it. And I'm going to say, ah, oh, that's not really slander. That's just the truth. You know what I'm saying? But what is your motivation in doing that? Are you slamming them? Are you destroying a person? Are you tearing down their reputation? And again, technology is a, is a great thing, but it can be used to sin so much uh, more quickly and with more devastating effect. And so, man, you can slander by, you know, that group text that you're in, just, and then all of a sudden you've slandered somebody in 30 seconds. And you slandered them not just to one person, but to five or 10 or whatever it is. Right? You can make a social media blast and tear someone down with slander in a heartbeat. We can even spiritualize it, right? Dress it up. Man, you really need to pray for this person because let me tell you about what they got going on. I mean, that, that's what we do. And friends, this should not happen anywhere. It should not happen out here in the culture. You should not be doing this anywhere, but especially about brothers and sisters. Right? This is a family of God. If we do it, uh, love will not flourish. Love will not flourish here if we do these things. Moving on more quickly. Again, we love one another earnestly. Now down to verse 2, chapter 2. True Christians long deeply for God. Again, everybody's got loves and longings. The longings of our heart, they tell us about ourselves. What our minds gravitate towards when there's nothing else to think about that reveals the true state of our souls often. So William Temple, who's a, uh, an Anglican pastor from a, another century, he put it this way. He says, your religion is what you do with your solitude. Your true religion is what you do with your solitude. And so we think it's about, you know, our outward actions. You know, am I coming to worship? Am I giving? Am I serving? You know, am I reading? Spiritual disciplines and those things. And, and those things are certainly important. But... Again, it's all about our longings. And what is our longing supposed to be? He says, verse 2, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. This is what we are to long for. Pure spiritual milk. Like newborn infants. Now we have lots of infants, lots of newborns around here. More on the way. I love that, yeah, this is just a season that we're in. You know, we joke about the, being in the water or whatever else, but it's a glorious thing to have signs of life all over the place. So we should know this, right? Infants are not indifferent to eating, all right? They're not like, ah, I think I, could, I can wait a little longer. Oh, I'm going to skip lunch today. I'm good, really. I had a big breakfast. Infants are not doing that, right? We, we, we most of us know this. I, I certainly know this in our house. Like, so... Yeah, infants want, they crave, they long for milk. And so we're the same way, right? We get snappy, grouchy, we get hangry, right? You know, hangry, right? We get hangry. And so in the same way that uh, Josh Sugg, I, I was with him at a conference. I always got to pick on Josh when I talk about food. So in the same way that Josh is like snacking on things all day long, loves his, you know, because he's got a crazy metabolism and all those things. Like, we, we all get hangry, right? In the same way that we are craving our snacks and going after food, we are to crave pure spiritual milk. Now, elsewhere in the New Testament, milk is a bad thing if you're a Christian. It signifies that you're immature, that you're not craving the meat. But that's not what he's doing here. He's saying here we are sustained by the milk of God's word. We're sustained by the very gospel that has saved us. And so this is a good thing. We're supposed to crave this and eat this continually. This is to be our regular diet that we long for this, that we would grow up into the salvation that has already been established for us, that we would grow up into it and actually reflect the Christ who has purchased us and saved us. So this happens. Notice that the, the word of God is, is central to all these things. The word of God and the gospel are the way that we grow by pressing in, by getting into the word, by listening to sound, faithful preaching. This is the way we grow. And it's our, it's our steady diet. Maybe this is going to be weird, but, but my family growing up was a, a milk-drinking family. I don't know. That was just what my mom did. And so, like, literally, we have two sisters. So there was five of us total. Um, mom, dad, me, two sisters. And so we would literally go into the store and buy, like, five gallons of milk, like, to last, like, a week. It, I mean, it was part of our diet. 
I mean, that's just what we did. Milk all the time. That's what your intake of the Word of God should look like. Should be steady, should be daily, should be regular. This is what we do. This is how we grow as God's people. And ultimately, our, our longing is for God. Why, why is it that we do this? Why, as infants, do we long for pure spiritual milk? Well, again, the baby is not crying for milk because someone says, this is what you need to do if you want to be a good baby. Like, you know, like, you need to do this, you know. And the baby's like, okay, well, if you say so, I'm going to crave the milk. No, 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 that's just who they are. That's who they, that, that's what they are. That's what they want. That's their desires. And so the way that works out for us as Christians is that who we are is a people that have tasted and known that the Lord is good. Verse 3. We've tasted and known that the Lord is good. And so our, our motivation to, to love each other, our motivation to pursue each other, to immerse ourselves in the word, it's not legalistic. It's not duty-based. It's not forced. It's not what it is. Instead, it's motivated by an overwhelming sense of the goodness and the kindness of our God Tom Schreiner put it this way. He says, longing to grow spiritually comes from a taste of the beauty of the Lord. He's right. If you have tasted of the Lord, you will want more, right? If you taste something good, give me some more of that. And friends, the Lord is good. We know that the Lord is good, not just by hearing sermons on God's goodness, not by reading books on His goodness, not by hearing others speak of His goodness, although all those things are good things. The way we know that the Lord is good is by tasting, by experiencing for ourselves that He is good. This is not abstract knowledge. This is not Johnny Theologian over here saying, well, my doctrine of God under moral attributes God is good. That's not what's going on here. This is concrete, tangible, real. This is the way we experience the love and goodness of God. We know that he is good because we have tasted the sweetness of God for ourselves. So just want to end by by quoting where where Peter quotes here in this verse. Listen to Psalm 34 as, as David is boasting in the Lord. He says this, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried. He's talking about himself and his own spiritual poverty. He says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. Even the young lions, he said, the young lions who are spry and frisky and have all kinds of energy, even them, even those lions suffer want and hunger from time to time. But he says, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Church, do you hear this? Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Are you a struggling saint here this morning? I would say taste and see and know in the midst of your struggle that yes, even then the Lord is good. If you are here as an unpersuaded believer, I urge you, I invite you, would love to talk to you after the service. Friend, the Lord is good. The Lord is satisfying beyond your wildest imagination. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And this is what drives our love. We've tasted and known the mercy and the goodness of God, the love of God. 
so that overflows in our hearts for one another. We love each other. We put away things that would destroy love. We put on the things that promote love. And so I'm going to pray in just a second. Pastor Josh is going to come. We're going to, we're going to have the Lord's Supper uh, today. I want to urge you even to reflect about the things that we have seen in God's Word before you take the supper. Maybe there's particular sin. Maybe there's malice. There's envy. There's some deceit. There's slander. There's something that you need to confess to the Lord. Maybe even you need to confess it to a brother or sister. We'll just encourage you. Maybe this is not the day for you to, to come to the Lord's table. It's okay to do that. It's okay to say, you know what? We're gonna, we do the Lord's Supper every, every month. First Sunday of every month is our, is our practice here. So I'm going to catch it on the next go-round, and I'm going to sit, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to stand, and I'm going to pray for that, for that relationship that's busted up, for that brother or sister that I have sin in my heart about. And then after this service or sometime in the week, we're going to get coffee or a lunch or a meal or text message or something, and we're going to get things right. Maybe this is the day that you need to do that. Whatever it is, just want to invite you to pray with me now, even as we prepare for, uh, for the supper as well. Lord, we thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you um, are all satisfying, that you are rich love, that you give us boundless, joyful freedom to walk in. And Lord, I pray, God, that we would be people who love each other sincerely, love each other constantly, love each other earnestly from the heart, that we would be a, a place where God's love is known and seen, and that would be attractive to the world. And so, God, would you grant it? Would you grant that we would be that people? Would you also, though, grant repentance where it's necessary? Because love doesn't happen without transparency. Love doesn't happen without confession, repentance, honesty. And so, God, would you give us much grace to be that kind of people? It doesn't just give lip service to love. It doesn't just you know, smile and shake the hand. But, but, Lord, we genuinely care about each other and are in each other's lives. God, do it, we pray, by your Spirit. Do it because we've been born again, because we're new people. Do it above all for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name.